For oft when on my couch I lie, in vacant or in pensive mood, they flash upon that inward eye, which is the bliss of solitude. And then my heart with pleasure fills and dances with the daffodils. So that's an excerpt from I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud, and this is Tea Time Thoughts. I'm Kaylin, as always, and today we're talking about William Wordsworth and his poetry. So today I'm drinking chamomile tea, courtesy of my friend Brenna. She sent this to me in the birthday kit that she gave me a couple weeks ago, and chamomile is one of my favorites, so she knows me too well. <laughs> and thank you, Brenna. It's delicious. So if you don't know who William Wordsworth is, he helped create um, the genre of romanticism in literature. And the essential meaning behind romanticism is to gain inspiration from the world, to emphasize individuality, the metaphysical nature of man, and it also involves a longing for a more simple past and a desire to connect with nature. All of this is significant because William Wordsworth lived through quite a lot of events that launched the world into the modern age. Some of these events included the American and French revolutions, the Napoleonic Wars, and most importantly, the rise of industrialism. And he can see how the world is changing kind of from a front row seat, but he's noticing that not all of these changes are necessarily taking place for the better. And I think we can really see some of his anxieties on this score in his poem, The World is Too Much With Us. The world is too much with us, late and soon. Getting and spending, we lay waste to our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon. The wind that will be howling at all hours and are gathered up now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn. So my eye, standing on this pleasant lee, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn. Have sight of protes coming from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. So William Wordsworth, much like other poets during his time, he was really concerned with the growth of factories as a result of the Industrial Revolution. And even though some of these changes were beneficial to the world as in a growth of international economy and the transportation of people and goods on a greater scale than seen before, there are also a lot of downsides to it as well. If you've ever seen North and South, you see kind of what the conditions of these factories are like. And one thing that we don't really even get to see in that is the amount of children that are going in to work in these factories. And a lot of these jobs are life-threatening, not only for health conditions, but some of the jobs that they work too, it's so easy to lose body parts. And aside from how dangerous the jobs are, they are producing a lowering of agricultural work and they're causing pollution as well. But William Wordsworth notices some of these changes, especially the changes to nature and the focus of man towards cities and machinery rather than the world that they're surrounded by. He also notices the emotional changes that are impacting people around him. He was friends with other Romanticist era poets like William Blake and Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And one of the places that William Wordsworth specifically finds comfort is in nature. In his poem, The Table Turned, or if you're an Office fan, The Turned Table, um, he talks about some of his frustrations with being overwhelmed with the world and from this point of view he's encouraging a friend to basically just go take a walk with him and leave everything behind for a while and appreciate the world around him in all of its beauty and glory instead. Up, up, my friend, and clear your looks. Why all this toil and trouble? Up, up, my friend, and quit your books, or surely you'll grow double. The sun above the mountain's head, a freshening luster mellow, through all the long green fields has spread his first sweet evening yellow. Books, tis a dull and endless strife, come hear the woodland linnet. How sweet his music on my life, there's more of wisdom in it. And hark how blithe the throstle sings, he is no mean preacher. Come forth into the light of things, let nature be your teacher. She has a world of ready wealth, our minds and hearts to bless. Spontaneous wisdom breathed by health, truth breathed by cheerfulness. Our impulse from a vernal wood may teach you more of man, of moral evil and of good than all the sages can. 
Sweet is the lore which nature brings, our meddling intellect, misshapes the beauteous form of things we murder to dissect. Enough of science and of art, close up these barren leaves, come forth and bring with you a heart that watches and receives. So it's interesting that these things that we look at, like science and art and books, we would think now that that's a noble pursuit because we probably spend a good amount of each day looking at a screen or so. And I'm guilty of this as, as well, but it's interesting because it almost seems like he's anti-educational, but this is actually not the case. He's trying to draw an emphasis away from all this modernization and all these changes to focus on the world and what we can learn from it. And I'm sure that he doesn't mean that we shouldn't live in this modern world. I'm sure that he acknowledges some of the benefits of it as well as the faults, but I think that he means that there needs to be a balance. I think he can see the emotional toil that being too much involved in the world can have on somebody. He's certainly aware of these negative types of emotions and the stress that a person can come under from being overwhelmed. A lot of people tend to say that his poetry is very fluffy because in some of his poems about nature, he's talking about birds and rainbows and dancing daffodils. So we tend to think it's a somewhat sugary poem and it doesn't have the bitterness that we look for when we're trying to find rich literature. But going through some of his stuff, you can see that this certainly isn't true. William Wordsworth himself experienced quite a lot of personal tragedies in his life. For instance, he was orphaned at the age of 13 and his brother died at sea when he was about 25. His brother captained a ship in the Navy and the ship went down in a terrible storm. And while William was growing up, he went to live with his uncle and his grandfather for a while. And they were very hostile to him. And apparently he experienced so much negativity and hostility. He was contemplating suicide for a great deal of time. And then later in his life, he fell in love with a woman named Annette Vallon in France, who he actually fathered a daughter with. But during the reign of terror that followed the initial French Revolution with all these really terrible executions, he couldn't get into the country for several years to see them and ensure their safety. And once he was officially married to his childhood friend, Mary Hutchinson, he had five children with her, but he outlived three out of five of them which is a tragedy truly within itself because no parent should ever have to outlive a child. So several of his poems grapple with this idea of death and he's very familiar with it. And he personifies his mourning in the form of an English woman named Lucy who's died at a young age. And a lot of historians tend to debate whether or not Lucy was a real person that perhaps Wordsworth was in love with or if Lucy is, as I mentioned earlier, this personification of all the figures that he's lost in life, but it's clear that he demonstrates a lot of feeling when it comes to this, and you can see this in one of his poems called She Dwelt Among Untrodden Ways. She dwelt among the untrodden ways, beside the springs of dove, a maid whom there were none to praise and very few to love, a violet by a mossy stone, half hidden from the eye, fair as a star when only one is shining in the sky, she lived unknown, and few could know when Lucy ceased to be, but she is in her grave, and oh, the difference to me. There's a lot of, even though it's one of his shorter poems, there's a lot of feeling there. It's kind of tragic to lose someone and know that in the grand scheme of this vast world that no one's really going to notice not only your loss, but the absence of somebody that means so much to you. You would think that it shouldn't mean a lot to him or it shouldn't be such a big deal because death is something that even about 200 or 300 years ago people were a lot more acquainted with than we are with it now. So one thing I actually learned on my English study abroad, William Wordsworth grew up in Grasmere, but we went to a town that was neighboring Grasmere called Hawthorne and they said that the life expectancy for an individual in the town of Hawthorne was about 28 but that was mainly because the child mortality rate was so high. So if a child managed to live past the age of about 12 or 13, then they had a fairly good chance of surviving to adulthood and the life expectancy for an adult is about the age of 63. But 
if you look at the graveyard that's up on the hill of the town, it's just packed brim to brim with so many different tombstones and engravings. It's just, it's impossible to really fathom how frequent death was for these people back then. The sad thing is, if you go through one of these cemeteries and you look through the headstones, so many names and titles and little insights into these people's lives are are gone. They've worn away over time and it helps you kind of get a perspective of what William Wordsworth says that the rest of the world doesn't really notice but to the people that are close it means all the difference to them. And there's really no way to turn around from that note but Wordsworth has a very famous definition of poetry as the spontaneous overflow of powerful feelings and he says that it takes its origin from the emotion recollected in tranquility. So as you can see from a great deal of his poetry, he has a lot of emotion involved with his writing, and he definitely took the time to go out to some places that were quiet and peaceful to him, and I can honestly think of no greater place to find inspiration than in Grasmere, where he lived. And I visited two of his homes. Um, the first one was Dove Cottage, where he and his sister Dorothy lived. And then the second was Rydal Mount. And Rydal Mount was a bit bigger because he was able to make more money as, as a poet and afford a nicer house. But going through the walk from Rydal Mount to Dove Cottage, it's just incredible. Wordsworth was completely surrounded by absolutely beautiful natural scenes. There are these wonderful lakes around him and beautiful gardens and trees and green hills that just are everywhere as far as the eye can see and what's wonderful is this trail that you can walk through and about part way through there's this little riding hut that he used to sit at and it would shield from the rain because England is not only known for being especially rainy but the day that we went there it was one of the only refuges that were really there amongst the path underneath all the trees. And he would sit there to collect his thoughts and write. And at one point he even invited Ralph Waldo Emerson to come visit him. And they were said to have sat in one of those huts and discussed literature and great works. And it's just incredible to think about what lines he could have written while he was in that spot. So I took advantage of that and you know wrote a couple poems while I was there myself, ever being the fan of romanticism that I am. But again, there's that reminder of death partway through because about a mile and a half or so down this path, there's a large stone that they called the Coffin Stone. And that was for people that were carrying coffins to the local church to be buried, to rest the coffin and let themselves have a bit of a break before they carried on the rest of the distance to the town. And again, I had similar thoughts to his little riding hut, like or what moments there impacted William Wordsworth in this way? Were there any especially hard or tender moments there that he witnessed or moments of great vulnerability? His poetry is an insight into this, but we might never really get the full picture of what he went through in those moments. It is something that's sad, but at the same time, considering all of that, we're so lucky that he wrote as much as he did because I have a small anthology here, but I know I'm just barely scratching the surface of all the things that he's written and also all the things that his sister Dorothy has written too. There are a lot of accounts of their life in Grasmere together and it's really quite wonderful. Another little fun fact here, my foot is falling asleep. That's not the fun fact, but... <laughs> Um, so while William and Dorothy and their family were living at Dove Cottage, their average budget was about 90 pounds or so a year, and they spent about 30 pounds on that every year on tea. So imagine carving out a third of your yearly salary and dedicating that to tea. Honestly, I respect it. <laughs> Especially reading these particular accounts of them enjoying their, their lives together, their daily walks and little moments that they spend enjoying their gardens and flowers. It's, it's really quite wonderful and we get to see some of these happier moments in his lives captured in some of the poetry that people would deem to be fluffy or, you know, just sugary nonsense. But some of these poems are among my favorites because I love to see the little bits of happiness that he has and the peace that he finds in a world that is going through a great amount of change. And so this is something that you can see in his poem called My Heart Leaps Up When I Behold. 
My heart leaps up when I behold a rainbow in the sky. So it was when my life began. So it is now I am a man. So it be when I shall grow old or let me die. The child is father of the man. And I wish my days to be bound each to each by natural piety. So that line here, the child is the father of the man. That's something that has sparked a lot of interest and debate. To me, I think it means that we can learn a lot from the innocent joy that we had when we were children because, you know, a lot of people complain about what it is to have adult life and responsibilities now. But I think that trying to live a bit more simply in whatever way is possible is a great idea and is a great antidote for this crazy world that we're living in. And I think that we have a lot of evidence in favor of things like that. We know how much social media can bring us down. We know how important it is for us to go outside and experience the world while looking straight up at it instead of instead of just looking down at a screen the whole time and you know these are things that I know I need to improve on and I know that they'll make a difference once I start making these changes but being able to go through and review these poems for this episode I think it's something that's really going to help me make that little boost just today actually I took a walk with my sister and my little niece, she's seven months now, so she's still in the stroller, but it was just fun passing by some of these little bushes or trees, and we'd push the stroller up close to it and let her look at the leaves and feel them, and then after she kind of became familiar with the leaves, whenever we'd pass something, she would kind of stick her arm out of the stroller and try to reach it. I don't know, I think we could all afford to be a little bit more like William Wordsworth in his mindfulness and focus on connecting with Earth rather than connecting with the world at large. So those are my thoughts on William Wordsworth, and thank you guys for listening. I'm Kaylin, as always, and this is Tea Time Thoughts. I'll talk to you next week. Bye. Hey guys, just wanted to leave a quick little postscript here for you. Um, first of all, what do you guys think of the new intro? Um, the song is La Ci Darem La Mano from Mozart's Don Giovanni, and that's actually me playing the piano in that recording. So if you like it, please let me know. If not, I'll look at something else that maybe is a bit more fitting and also please if you enjoyed this podcast or if you've enjoyed any other episodes please leave a review it really does help boost the podcast and please like comment if the platform that you're listening to allows you to follow or subscribe that would be great i would very much appreciate it and i hope you guys are all staying safe and healthy and i wish you all the best and i'll talk to you next week bye